It's good to be back home. Glad to be here. Appreciate your prayers for me. I was told that sleep deprivation is a challenge, has some of the similar effects as alcohol, and that I was sleep drunk after returning home. So what you're getting today is a hangover. (laughs) So we'll see where that goes. 2 Chronicles chapter 32. We're fixing to find out just how many of you really prayed for me. We're going to dig in here to the end of Hezekiah's life and learn this final lesson from this story about how we should trust the Lord. And it's going to be so encouraging to us. So let's dig in here. Second Chronicles chapter 32. If you don't have your Bible today, for whatever reason, please feel free to use the Bible you'll find there in the pew. I would love for you to read along, and you can turn to about page 340 or so. And you can find Second Chronicles chapter 32 and read along with us every verse here in this chapter. All right, verse 1. After these acts of faithfulness, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and invaded Judah and besieged the fortified cities and thought to break into them for himself. Now when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come and that he intended to make war on Jerusalem, he decided with his officers and his warriors to cut off the supply of water from the springs which were outside the city, and they helped him. So many people assembled and stopped up to all the springs and the stream which flowed through the region, saying, Why should the kings of Assyria come and find abundant water? And he took courage and he rebuilt all the wall that had been broken down and erected towers on it. He built another outside wall and strengthened the Milo in the city of David. And he made weapons and shields in great number. He appointed military officers over the people and gathered them to him in the square at the city gate. And he spoke encouragingly to them, saying, Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be dismayed because of the king of Assyria, nor because of all the horde that is with him. For the one with us is greater than the one with him. With him is only an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people relied on the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. In this first scene, we see Hezekiah decide to trust the Lord in the face of danger. All he's doing is acting like God is who he says he is. Sennacherib has come against Judah to destroy Judah just like it destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel. And and Sennacherib wants to attack him, and Hezekiah is simply responding to the danger by acting like God is who he says he is. Now notice, Hezekiah is busy doing a lot of fortifying, gathering the people together, organizing them, making sure they're ready for battle. But when Hezekiah stands before the people, what does he say? Does he say, we've done a good job assembling the troops? We've done a great job fortifying the wall. We've done a great job stopping up the springs. We are ready for the battle because of all that we've done. No, that's not what he says. He says to the people, what makes the difference between us and the ensuing battle and whether we win or we lose is God. Yeah, we've done everything we can. We are prepared for battle as much as possible. But the difference maker is that God is with us. And we are going to be a people who act like God is who he says he is. He just encourages the people to trust in the Lord and to know that he is the difference maker. Now look what Sennacherib does. 
Verse 9, after this, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, sent his servants to Jerusalem while he was besieging Lachish and all his forces with him against Hezekiah, king of Judah, against all Judah who were at Jerusalem, saying, Thus says Sennacherib, king of Assyria, On what are you trusting that you are remaining in Jerusalem under siege? Is not Hezekiah misleading you to give yourselves over to die by hunger and by thirst, saying, The Lord our God will deliver us from the hand of the king of Assyria? Has not the same Hezekiah taken away his high places and his altars and said to Jude and Jerusalem, you shall worship before one altar and on it you shall burn incense? Do you not know what I and my fathers have done to all the peoples of the lands? Were the gods of the nations of the lands able to, at all to deliver their land from my hand? Who was there among all the gods of those nations which my fathers utterly destroyed who could deliver his people out of my hand, that your God should be able to deliver you from my hand. Now, therefore, do not let Hezekiah deceive you or mislead you like this, and do not believe him. For no God of any nation or kingdom was able to deliver his people from my hand or from the hand of my fathers. How much less will your God deliver you from my hand? His servant spoke further against the Lord God and against his servant Hezekiah. He also wrote letters to insult the Lord God of Israel and to speak against him, saying, As the gods of the nations of the lands have not delivered their people from my hand, so the God of Hezekiah will not deliver his people from my hand. They called this out with a loud voice in the language of Judah, in the heart language, to the people of Jerusalem who were on the wall to frighten them and terrify them so that they might take the city. They spoke of the God of Jerusalem as of the gods of the peoples of the earth, the work of men's hands. So you have this contrast between Hezekiah and Sennacherib. Hezekiah is acting like God is who he says he is, calling the people to trust the Lord in the face of danger. Sennacherib is presenting that danger, and Sennacherib's acting like God is not who he says he is. He's acting like God is just like every other God of every other nation he's conquered, the work of men's hands. He's treating God like he's an idol, like he's incapable, like he's dead, like he's nothing. And he's just acting like God is not who he says he is. So you have this contrast between Hezekiah and Sennacherib. Hezekiah acting like God is who he says he is. Sennacherib not acting like God is who he says he is. One of these guys is going to be really disappointed. Verse 20. But King Hezekiah and Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos, prayed about this and cried out to heaven. And the Lord sent an angel who destroyed every mighty warrior, commander, and officer in the camp of the king of Assyria. So he returned in shame to his own land, and when he had entered the temple of his God, some of his own children killed him there with the sword. So the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, king of Assyria, and from the hand of all others, and guided them on every side. And many were bringing gifts to the Lord at Jerusalem and choice presents to Hezekiah, king of Judah, so that he was exalted in the sight of all nations thereafter. Hezekiah experienced the blessings and the goodness of God and the promises of God by way of trusting in the Lord. It was God who was their deliverer, and Hezekiah experienced the deliverance of God through trusting in the Lord in the face of danger. And this story is told so that we might understand, so the people in the day of Chronicler might understand the only way to experience the blessings and the goodness of God and the promises of God is by trusting in the Lord. And here we have this incredible story encouraging each one of us To trust in the Lord, knowing that that's the only way to experience the goodness of God found in the promises of God. I love the irony in this story. Sennacherib says, your God's not going to protect you from me. Because your God's just like every other God and all these other nations I've already wiped out. Hezekiah says, no, I'm going to trust God that he is who he says he is. 
And God delivers Hezekiah and he brings shame and defeat upon Sennacherib. And then Sennacherib goes home and he's inside the house of his God. I mean, he's really close to his God. And being inside the house of his God, his own God can't protect him from his own children who slay him. The irony is unbelievable. There is no God like the God of the Bible. He is the one true living God. His promises are more certain than anything else in this world. And the only avenue to experiencing the goodness of God's promises is through trusting in the Lord. Now, The chronicler has told this story so that we might understand even more about what it means to trust the Lord. In the remainder of the chapter, he gives us this fly-by view, this big picture view of some of the key things in Hezekiah's life in order to demonstrate exactly what the chronicler wants us to see about trusting the Lord. So we're going to hear just a sentence or two about some big stories that are found elsewhere in the scripture that all of them listening in the chronicler's day would have been familiar with. So we're going to literally get one sentence about these stories. And if you're not familiar with these stories, you're going to be at somewhat of a disadvantage because everybody that's hearing the stories in the day of the chronicler knows the full story. And he's just pulling out one aspect of a couple stories here to further teach about what it means to trust God. And so if you're not familiar with these stories, I'll read through these. You can read them later. You'll find them in Isaiah chapter 38. If you're taking notes, write this down, Isaiah chapter 38, and then you'll find them also in 2 Kings chapter 20. I would encourage you to read these stories at a later time if you're not familiar with them. Now, I'll give you enough to be able to understand what the point is from the perspective of the chronicler, but you need to go ahead and read these to understand exactly what's happening in the story as a whole. All right, so let's read starting in verse 20. uh, the right page, 24. In those days, Hezekiah became mortally ill. He prayed to the Lord. The Lord spoke to him, gave him a sign. Okay, there's the sentence referencing this big story about Hezekiah's illness. He's going to die. And in the face of death, as a result of an illness, Hezekiah does not act like God is not who he says he is. He doesn't act like I'm going to die because I'm sick. He doesn't look at his sickness as the reason he's going to die. He knows that God holds life in his hand, gives life, and takes life away. And so Hezekiah, in the face of this illness, acts like God is who he says he is and prays to God and says, God, if you will just deliver me, if you will make me well, I would love that. He asks the Lord. He weeps before the Lord. The Lord responds and he heals him and gives him 15 more years of life. Gives him a sign for that to be accomplished and really blesses him in this facing difficulty. So once again, Hezekiah trusts the Lord in the face of difficulty. God answers and blesses him. All right, verse 25. But Hezekiah gave no return for the benefit he received because his heart was proud. Therefore, wrath came on him and on Judah and Jerusalem. So when Hezekiah experiences all this favor from God, he becomes prideful in response to this blessing. And he gets into sin, and God's wrath is rightly directed toward him because of his pride. And look what happens here. Verse 26, however, Hezekiah humbled the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord did not come on them in the days of Hezekiah. So God's wrath is directed towards Hezekiah rightly because Hezekiah has walked into sin and pride. Then Hezekiah humbles himself in that pride, turns back to the Lord, and the Lord refrains from dispensing the wrath that is due Hezekiah because of his sin. And instead extends gracious, compassionate forgiveness so that Hezekiah continues to experience the goodness of God in the fulfillment of the promises of God. So again, we have this picture here of Hezekiah's trust, and now we have this added detail of Hezekiah's humility. So it's not just trusting the Lord, acting like he is who says he is, but it's humbly trusting the Lord. This this emphasis on humility. 
And God refrains from pouring his wrath out. And we see his gracious compassion. All right? So let's continue reading. We're going to hear about God's blessings on Hezekiah. Verse 27. Now Hezekiah had immense riches and honor. And he made for himself treasures for gold, for silver, precious stones, spices, shields, and all kinds of valuable articles. Storehouses also for the produce of grain, wine, and oil, pens for all kinds of cattle and sheepfolds for the flocks. He made cities for himself and acquired flocks and herds in abundance, for God had given him very great wealth. It was Hezekiah who stopped up the upper outlet of the waters of Gihon and directed them to the west side of the city of David. Hezekiah prospered in all he did. He is experiencing the blessings of God's promises through humbly Trusting the Lord. Now, in case we didn't get that aspect of humility, here's another story. Verse 31. Even, so he prospers even in the matter of the envoys of the rulers of Babylon who sent to him to inquire of the wonder that had happened in the land. God left him alone to test him that he might know all that was in his heart. So Hezekiah prospers in this story as well. And we are told about Hezekiah being tested. Now if we were in the day of Chronicler, we would have a good working knowledge of the history of Israel. And we would immediately associate this aspect of the story of Hezekiah's life with other stories that we know about our history. When God tests His people, He's testing his people for a reason. And you would immediately think of God testing the people of Israel as he took them out of Egypt and took them through the wilderness. And you remember Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 16, that says God tests his people to humble them for their good. See, God is testing his people to bring about humble trust in the Lord so that they might experience His goodness in His promises through that humble trust. You would have thought about the story of Abraham, how he was called to sacrifice his son Isaac. This was a test from God, and it brought Abraham to the place of humbly trusting in the Lord where he then would experience the blessings of God's promises through that humble trust. There's an emphasis here in the latter part of the story in 2 Chronicles on humility so that we might understand that trusting in the Lord is humbly trusting in the Lord, and that is the avenue for experiencing the blessings of God found in the promises of God. And what I'm praying this morning is that you're sitting there right now and you're thinking about this story, and in your heart you are responding with these kinds of thoughts. Lord, I really want to be the kind of person who humbly trusts you. I really want to be that kind of person. If that's you this morning, this story gives a great insight on what that looks like in our lives. See, if you're going to be a kind of person that humbly trusts the Lord, which is the only avenue to experiencing the blessings of His promises, If you're going to be that kind of person, a great place to start is right where Hezekiah is exemplifying this humble trust. See, in the face of danger, in the face of difficulty, in the face of testing, Hezekiah is simply acting like God is who he says he is. You you want to be the kind of person that trusts in the Lord, humbly trusts in the Lord? Well, then in the face of your difficulty, in in the face of whatever danger may come, in the face of your testing, and some of you are in those circumstances this morning, then just decide, I'm going to act today in this circumstance like God is who He says He is. Years and years ago, there was a lady who was living in Arkansas And God moved in her life, and she made a decision to leave her home and her home state and go on the other side of the world and give her life 
seeking to find a way for the gospel of Jesus Christ to break through the barriers that existed around a particular people group in another nation that had no Christian witness, no Christians in the people group, no Bible in their language, no way for them to come to know Christ. And she picked up and she moved as close as she could to that people group. You see, she couldn't get very close to them because she would have been ostracized, she would have been arrested, she would have been maybe even abused and and suffered physically for being in that place. She would have been completely rejected because there was nobody accepted from the Western world in that people group at that time. So she moved as close as she could and began to pray and seek for a way to reach this people group that would have no other way to know God except that God enabled her somehow to reach them, but she believed that God is who He says He is, and she knows that God has promised that someone from every people group is going to gather around the throne of God and sing praises to God someday, and she just knew there's some way that these people can come to know Christ. It's really interesting to hear her talk about it. She didn't even know where the people were. She couldn't find them. She couldn't figure it out. She couldn't get to them when she found out where they were. And one day, these people from another mountain range over ended up in the city where she was living. And they were believers, and they came to that city, and they connected with her. And they had come to know Christ through someone's faithful service in the early 1900s. You can read that story in the book called Mountain Rain. And these people who come to know Christ um, had come over to her city and they connected and she said, would you be willing to go into this village where my people group is and share Christ with them? I can't get in there. You guys probably can. And so they went over there for a couple weeks and began to share Christ and participate in what's happening in daily life in that village group. And one man came to Christ during that time. This was like 10 years ago. Little did she know what kind of results would occur because of one man deciding to trust Christ. And this one man, when he made the decision to trust Christ, it was was a decision literally to trust Christ no matter what. Because he he would be persecuted, he would be arrested, He would be mistreated. His family would be mistreated. His kids would be mistreated. Everything he'd be ostracized from because he decided to follow Christ. And many people in his village would treat him very differently and very meanly and very, you know, he would experience persecution because of his decision. But he knew when he decided to trust Christ that in the face of danger, he would simply keep trusting in the Lord because God is who he says he is. And this guy became this light in the darkness. And over the next 10 years, he was instrumental in a th- almost 1,000 people in this people group coming to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And in the last two years, almost half of those numbers have come to Christ because they've begun to translate the stories of Jesus into their heart language and they're going into these villages and they're telling the stories about Jesus in the language that they've learned to speak from the time they were born. So they're hearing about Jesus Christ in their heart language and people are just responding to Christ and this one guy is being used by the Lord to create this great movement in this area of the world. And I'm telling you, I loved hanging out with that guy for about 10 hours this week. I got to hang out with him and three other believers from that people group. And I got to see them take a story that Jesus Christ told, translate it into their heart language, so they can go back to the villages and tell more people about Jesus. This woman that left Arkansas and came there was there in that meeting. and She told me that one time she asked this man, Why do you keep following Jesus? It's so hard for you. And he just said to her, because I made a decision to trust him. That was it. In the face of danger, 
humble trust is simply just acting like God is who he says he is. In the face of danger, in the face of difficulty, in the face of testing. If you're going to humbly trust the Lord, it's just going to look like you acting like he is who he says he is. Now Hezekiah gives us another insight into this humbly trusting when he makes a major mistake by becoming prideful. I mean, he fails, but then he comes back to the Lord. See, he humbles himself, and he comes back to the Lord. This is a huge aspect of the story, because this is the first time in all of Second Chronicles that any king has followed the Lord, turned away from the Lord, and then come back to the Lord. Asa was fired up for the Lord, turned away from the Lord, never came back. Jehoshaphat, following the Lord, never came back. Jehoshaphat did it, Joash did it, Asa did it, Amaziah did it, Uzziah did it. He became prideful, turned away from the Lord, never came back to his destruction. And here's the first king. He's fallen the Lord. God blesses him. He becomes prideful in that blessing. And then he humbles himself and he comes back to the Lord. And the chronicler is telling us, this is what it looks like to trust the Lord. God's not after your perfect trust in him. He's after your humble trust in Him. See, none of us here, nobody in this room can offer perfect trust in the Lord. You cannot perfectly believe in the Lord. And sometimes I think we think that that's what God's after. I've just not trusted Him enough and it's not done good enough in the way I've trusted Him. No, He's not after your perfect trust. He's after your humble trust so that the moments you stumble, the moments you fall, the moment you're struggling, you just keep humbling yourself and turning back to the Lord. That is the avenue to the blessings of God's promises. Humble trust in God. I got to spend some time with our people group, the people group that we've adopted as a church family. And I got to spend some time with believers, some friends that I've made over the years. And it was like 12 or 13 years ago when we decided to adopt this uh, unreached people group as a church family. And, and there was no scripture in their language. There was no church in uh, their, their language. There, there, was, there was no way that uh, they could come to know and follow Christ without someone coming in there and helping them. And so we were a part of adopting them and being a part of that effort for the last 12, 13 years. I got to spend some time with them, and I got to hear this one particular lady's story, and it was so incredibly encouraging. She came to Christ several years ago, and her relationship with the Lord is, is initially was built around what she could understand about the Lord through reading the Bible she had in the language she could read. This is a language she learned later in grade school. It's not the language she grew up speaking. It's not her heart language. And so learning about God in this secondary language was a challenge. A challenge that she really was not fully aware of. It'd be kind of like you and me trying to learn about God. Here we are. We are English speakers. That's our heart language. It'd be like you and me trying to learn about God by reading the King James Version in Spanish. See, we would, we would have certain perspectives on God and our relationship with God if all we knew was what we learned about God through a language that was not our heart language. There would be difficulty there, and it, it had become, it created difficulty for her. She was not even aware of it. Because the language we spoke, she spoke, it was very formal. She never really even prayed to the Lord in her personal life because she could not conceive of how she could pray to Him in this formal language. How she could talk to this high up God that required this kind of language to talk to him. And she just didn't pray. When they started talking about translating the scripture into her heart language, she was really resistant to that. Again, unaware of the impact of having only this one language to learn about God in. She's like, well, we got this language. We can read this. We can, we can see it here. Why do we need to go to all this effort to translate it into our heart language? And she was resistant to that initially. Until one day she was out with a friend and they were out strategically to share the gospel with people who could not speak any other language than their heart language. So one of our friends who lives over there 
translated the gospel presentation, a very simple presentation, into the heart language. These ladies memorized that. They went out and they were sharing with this older lady who could not speak anything else but the heart language. They shared the gospel message with her, and she prayed to receive Christ. And when she started praying, she prayed in her heart language. Well, this other lady had never heard anyone do anything spiritual about God in her heart language, ever. And here she hears this little old lady praying to God in her heart language, and it just melted her heart, and she realized, God speaks my language. And she started praying, and she's never stopped having this intimate prayer relationship with the Lord, and she's fired up about how God loves her and speaks to her and wants to hear Him speak to Him in her heart language. She's fired up. She's a part of this translation team. And today they have translated into the heart language 60% of the New Testament. They now have a church that meets in their heart language. They have two new elders. They're singing praise songs in their heart language. Why? Because this one lady was wrong. And she humbled herself. She's just a little piece and this whole thing that God's unfolding. Because people all along the way have just decided, I want to humbly trust the Lord. I want to act like God is who He says He is. It's the only way to experience the blessings of God. Now what's really interesting about this is it shouldn't work like this. I mean, think about it. The holiness of God demands perfection. Well, how is it that our less than perfect trust in Him can be the avenue for the blessings of God's promises. Well, Solomon and David and Rehoboam and Asa and Jehoshaphat and Amaziah, and Uzziah, Hezekiah, all these kings along the way in the line of David were all pointing to the son of David who would come and be the perfect king who would perform a perfect work on the cross so that our humble trust could be the avenue to experiencing the blessings of God. God does not require from you or me perfect trust. He requires humble trust in a perfect king who has performed a perfect work to forgive our sins so that we might be a people who know the goodness of God. So you have a decision today. In the face of your difficulty, in the face of your danger, in the face of your testing, we just act like God is who He says He is. And this morning, if you are far from the Lord, if you've stumbled along the way this last week, if you've neglected His Word, you've, you've not spent time in prayer, you, you've not talked to the Lord, if you're just distant from Him, if you've got pride in your life, if you've got some other sin in your life, listen, humbly trust the Lord by coming back to Him today, experiencing His grace and compassion. Humble trust in the Lord. It's the only avenue to experiencing the blessings of the promise of God found in Jesus Christ.